I'm so glad that the whole family could be here for that event. That surprised me, didn't it, you? <laughs> it takes a family to raise a child. And it takes a church family, a whole community to do that. Dear Father in heaven, as we open your word today, may your Holy Spirit be present as Jesus teaches us. In his name we ask. Amen. We certainly have a great deal of interest in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, because it assures us, it gives us a solid reason of hope regarding now and the future, revealing how heaven has a constant communication with humanity. Sometimes we live in the dark corridors of history and we look at human history wondering where it is tending. But the Bible and the book of Revelation tell us what our destiny is of hope. And it's a profound story that depicts in very few words world truth that's more profound and yet recognizable than anything that we could gain from reading a whole library of books. The climax of Revelation focuses on, yes, unprecedented troubles to come upon the world. Every venerable institution that we have thought will be secure is going to prove to be empty and vanity in the end. There are great powers that we have naively assumed that would be benign, that will change into those destructive forces of liberty and true human happiness. It is very solemn language, but this is how Revelation 16, verse 19 describes it. The cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Certainly, it isn't a very pretty picture. But common sense can just see how the injustice, the crime, and the corruption, and greed, and sensuality every day seem to be gaining the upper hand in our culture. The ruin of wars that we have seen in the media is an intimation of what the world is ultimately headed for, according to the book of Revelation. But what proves that the book of Revelation is truly inspired of God is its good news and not its bad news. Because Revelation tells us of redemption. It tells us of salvation in Jesus Christ. He is the primary figure, the Lamb, mentioned more than a dozen times. You see, God's wrath is not a back and forth retaliation against rebellious mankind because God is just too big and he's too wise for that kind of game playing. But the future time of trouble is simply the natural result of history, the history of mankind, which insists upon having its self-centered way. Although God has given us freedom of choice, Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one of us, to his own way. Man's final rebellion is symbolized in Revelation, in chapter 16, by the battle of Armageddon. It says, when the nations will give their power and authority to the beast, and Revelation 17, 14 says, these will make war with the Lamb. Who starts the war? The wicked of the earth start the war against the Lamb. They hate Christ. They are the ones that start the great war. It's not the Lamb. The Bible speaks of the great battle of Armageddon. Revelation 16, it also speaks of a time of trouble coming on the world like the world has never seen before. It is not God who brings the trouble upon the earth, and it is not God who provokes the battle of Armageddon. God, folks, does not bring disaster. It is wicked people who bring such troubles on the earth. The same seeds of rebellion and hatred and warfare which produce that strife have been sown in all the world over. 
And it is this spiritual rebellion against the law of God that will eventually lead the world into the time of trouble and the battle of Armageddon. But in the meantime, there is another spiritual power that is at work in the world to bring peace and to bring harmony and to make life livable. And that is the power of the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ culminating in his sacrifice. That is the power. And whenever and wherever that gospel is permitted to be proclaimed, there comes the peaceable fruits of righteousness, and nations are blessed. And so in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, we see a vivid picture of what is happening behind the scenes. The news, so to speak, behind the headlines. There are four terrible winds of human passion that are about to burst loose like a wild tornado. But God sends four angels whose specialty is to hold back those four winds until a special work is performed among mankind. And in this picture of Revelation 7, verses 1 through 4, we see that an angel has the seal of God. Amen. And this seal is placed upon the foreheads of God's people. That seal of God is what prepares you and me, sinners like you and me, to be ready for the second coming of Christ. Just also to prepare us for that last time of trouble that's coming upon the earth. And so now we ask the question, just what is that seal of the living God? And Ezekiel helps to understand that because he mentions a mark which is placed upon the foreheads of God's people in Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. And that mark is a sign of victory over all sin. You see, in Egypt, in Egypt, as the destroying angel went through the land to slay the firstborn of the Egyptians, he passed over those homes where the mark of the blood was placed on the doorpost. And so, in the final destruction, the destroying angels are commanded in Ezekiel 9, 6, Come not near any man upon whom is the mark. Do you de desire that mark? Do you desire that seal of God? Amen. Because it's placed in the forehead. And that signifies that it is in the character of that person. That mark, that seal, is a character that God has placed within that soul. The power that seals and applies that seal is the Holy Spirit of God. John further describes this seal in Revelation 14.1, saying that the 144,000 have the Father's name, that is his character, written in their foreheads. And what is God's name? In 1 John chapter 4, verse 6, we read, God is love. That is his character. That is his name. God is love. And when the people, when the character of the people of God are, are transformed into God's perfect love, then will the Father's name be written upon their foreheads. But how is love revealed? Romans chapter 13 and verse 10 says, Love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. So if we profess to have love, but do not fulfill the law of God, we deny the seal of God. And if we profess to keep God's commandments, but do not reveal love in our lives, we deny the Holy Spirit, who impresses the seal upon God's people, because the fruit of the Spirit is love. Galatians 5, verse 22. A seal is the sign of authority. It is associated with the laws of government. In Esther 8, verse 8, we read, The writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. 
You see, Queen Esther knew that if King Ahasuerus sealed the writing of the Persian law, it could never again be changed. And God says in Isaiah, seal the law among my disciples. Isaiah 8 verse 16. And we shall find the seal of God in his law, in his Ten Commandments. A seal needs to have three things in order for it to be legal. You need to have the name of the lawgiver in the seal. Number two, his position and authority. And number three, his territory over which he rules. For example, the Queen of England seal would read Elizabeth, that would be the name. Queen, that would be her position or authority of Great Britain, Ireland, and the Commonwealth. That would be her territory. And so now we ask, where can we find the seal of God in his law? We find it in the fourth commandment. Yes, concerning the Sabbath. Because only the Sabbath commandment contains all three essentials of the seal of God's law and his government. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, says the fourth commandment. Now that is the name of the lawgiver, the Lord thy God. Secondly, it says, in six days the Lord made. That is, he is the creator. That is his position. That is his authority. Thirdly, he made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. And so that is the territory over which he rules. All three elements of the seal are found in the fourth commandment regarding the seventh day Sabbath. And so when Isaiah spoke for God, he said, bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples. He spoke of a work of restoring God's law to its rightful place of authority. There is something in the law of God which evidently has been overlooked. It's been neglected by God's disciples. And this something was to be restored by the angel who places the seal of God upon the foreheads of God's people before the seventh angel, angel brings history to its end. And so now we ask this question, what is the commandment that is usually neglected by God's disciples today? It is indeed the fourth commandment, isn't it? The Sabbath commandment. Many have turned away. Many have turned away from the true Sabbath of the Lord, which is the seventh day. They have accepted a rest day chosen for them and commanded by an op a, a preposterous church, which day is the first day of the week. Our Lord says that his spirit his Holy Spirit sanctifies his people through the proper observance of the Sabbath. In Exodus 31, 13, we read, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. And further, it is by observing the Sabbath that God's people come to know him. In Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20, And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And so in order to receive the seal of God is to receive a distinguishing mark that sets one apart from others as very different and peculiar. The destroying angels are told, come not near any man upon whom is the mark, Ezekiel 9, 6. But all of the others, including the ancient men, which were before the house, were to be slain. Does the observance of the true Sabbath distinguish a person as different from most of the disciples of God in this world. Does it? Most certainly. Even in this so-called Christian age, one of the most peculiar things 
that a person can do is to observe the true Sabbath of the Lord, the seventh day, which is Saturday. The whole world, Christians and pagans included, they regularly use the Lord's true Sabbath as their busiest working day of the week. There are millions because of the influence of paganism and the, and the papacy who observe the first day of the week instead. And this very peculiarity of observing the seventh day is an evidence that it is indeed the seal of the living God. But it needs to be remembered that true Sabbath keeping is the fruit of a genuine conversion to Jesus Christ. It's not merely a case of resting on Saturday. To receive the seal of God through true Sabbath keeping is to receive the work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. It is a rest from sin. It is a rest from self-centeredness. Hebrews 4.9 reads, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into God's rest, his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from him, from his. And the works that we are to cease from are works, our works of pride, our works of selfish love, our works of self-centeredness. You see, the work of this angel in sealing God's people is the most important work that is going on in the world today. Amen. And it will continue until every nation and kindred and tongue and people, God's true followers, shall have been sealed. There is no power on earth or in hell that can prevent the accomplishment of this work. For this purpose, the four angels are continuing to hold back the winds of strife in the world a little longer. And that explains the mysterious interventions of God in the affairs of certain nations that have suffered tyranny and restrictions of religious liberty. The angels of God are holding back the four winds so that the work of the gospel can proceed. But only a little longer, because soon, Daniel says, will come the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So now is the time, folks, for us to receive the seal of God. Amen. Now is the time. God has made this promise. The sacrifice of Jesus on his cross is the only reconciling agency in existence. And therefore, it's come, it co follows that the coming of a preparation message of Elijah must be proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ in all of its reconciling power. Elijah will uplift the cross of Jesus Christ. It will be what unbelieving hearts find almost inconceivable. It will be a proclamation of what the Bible calls the atonement. And that will work miracles of grace worldwide. We read in the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, that the work of Elijah is one of reconciling fathers to their children. That means the entire human race in all of our multi-ethnic and multicultural disaffections and alienations. There is to be a blessed unity that is to be realized as people will kneel together around the cross of the Son of God in reconciled hearts. At last beholding, really seeing what the cross is about and perceiving its significance fully. And no, it will not be 100% successful. It would be except for one anti-Elijah message factor that is going to intrude through it, and that is this battle of Armageddon where the wicked will make war against the Lamb. Because side by side with this gospel healing truth of atonement, 
that God is sending forth upon this world, you see two movements developing. On the one hand, there is this blessed reconciliation at one moment of human hearts that God is giving with each other and also with the Heavenly Father. And simultaneously, on the other hand, is the aggravation of this hatred between humans and God. These two movements going on at the same time. It's kind of an ultimate polarization of the human race. The Bible calls it in the first angel's message, the hour of his judgment, God's judgment. And no one can be neutral and, and sit on the fence. And so that sealing work is going forward today. There is a vast number in every nation and kindred and tongue and people who will gladly receive the seal of God. And they will refuse the mark of the beast. And you're invited to be one of them to receive the seal of God. So the battle is the final scene of a world that is rejecting God's grace. At last, all of the masks, all of the pretense is going to be thrown off. And man's hatred, his enmity against God is going to be laid open for all to see. But how can mankind's puny war against God, how can that bother him? How can it affect him? There is one thing that will arouse God's wrath. God's wrath, it is that the wicked will try to take out their hatred against God by oppressing God's people. You see, how would you react? as a parent, if you saw uh, the gangsters beating up on your, on your child, your innocent child, trying to kill him because they hate you, kill your child to get at you, how would you feel? Why, I can assure you that every cell in your body would be shot through with adrenaline as righteous wrath drove you to the defense of your child, correct? Surely. So this gives us a little bit of insight into God's final wrath against sin. You see, God's wrath is not his selfishness. God's wrath is not selfishness on his part. God's wrath is coming to the defense of his people as the wicked assail them and oppress them. On the cross, Christ freely gave, forgave those who murdered him. And he was he keeping silent for, for thousands of years while tyrants and persecutors have tortured, they have killed his followers down through the millenniums because some seed of hope blossomed. Some hope was out there that humanity might be made better. That's why the delay in Jesus' coming. He has the, the belief that of some hope that some can be made better that they, their hatred can be removed by the gospel. You know, Lincoln called it the last best political hope for humanity, was the gospel of Christianity. God must give the world every chance to learn about it and to turn and to repent. But humanity has misinterpreted God's mysterious silence. They have misinterpreted that. And so when the world attempts to crucify the Lord again in the person of his saints, Armageddon will be its final refusal of God's grace. It will be a deliberate attempt to reenact Calvary and his cross on a global scale. And this ultimate choice, this tragic choice, a holy and divine will will be a withdrawing of his mercy, leaving the world to itself. You see, when the world says, banish God from me, push him out of my life, then God will leave them to themselves, and this will be the wrath of God. Do you see it? And bereft of God's mercy, as never before, except in Noah's flood, this world will be plunged into the final conflict of the Battle of Armageddon. You see, we really hardly even realize 
the how actively involved right now God's Holy Spirit is working to restrain that evil of the world holding it back counteracting people's murderous designs thank God that at least part of those time bombs are discovered before they go off and that police can catch at least some of the criminals who lurk secretly but God folks God cannot be the author he cannot be the originator of all of this mayhem that we see in the world those four angels are constantly increasingly straining themselves to hold back the four winds of final turmoil but God has commanded them to hang on tight until the gospel of his grace can accomplish its purpose in the world I want you to think seriously while you why you are alive today think seriously about that the focal point of revelation is not the terrible time of trouble that is coming because God has a whole lot better news for us than that there is a last day message of much more abounding grace those who finally reject God's grace will hear no scathing denunciation from the lips of the Father nor even from his son they will only hear the silence of God and the voice of their own accusing nagging conscience there is a message that can demonstrate God's grace this astounding work of grace is accomplished by the good news being proclaimed by the three angels special angels it's called in Revelation 14 the everlasting gospel we know it isn't a new innovation because of this but it is given in a modern setting of our last day needs it's in language that people can understand today that is symbolized as truth that is proclaimed by three angels flying like helicopters over the treetops I saw another angel writes John flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation tribe tongue and people saying with a loud voice fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of waters it's clear then that the angel symbolizes a worldwide proclamation of truth pure unadulterated truth a rediscovery of something that has long been lost it probes the solution to mankind's deepest problems both psychological and spiritual it is the conquest of our inner insecurities and so it embodies deliverance from every evil that enslaves and distorts your human soul and then you have a second and a third angel that follow the message of the three angels uh, complete one another they achieve a phenomenal worldwide impact among every nation tribe and people they hear it and what a courageous prediction it was for John to write about this 2,000 years ago for our hope and why is the message so striking worship him who made heaven and earth right there in the first angel you see swimming upstream almost alone against the world current of evolutionary teaching this creation message makes its way against popular opinion the memorial of his creation that God appointed is the seventh day Sabbath the true Lord's Day already in response to this angels message there are millions of Christians who are seventh day Sabbath keepers throughout the world they have sprung up in every nation and the call to fear God and give glory to him that is not a call for us to crawl on our stomachs and grovel like a cowering slave before a tyrannical master 
Fear God means to reverence Him, to cherish a humble appreciation of His love of his righteousness. That's what it means. God does not want us to shake with terror before him, but to shiver with the delightful thrill of appreciating his glorious self-sacrifice of love. It led the Son of God to yield himself totally on his cross. It makes shivers to run up and down your back to think about it. The death that he died for us, that is the equivalent of what the book Revelation calls the second death, the final yet unknown despair of being forsaken of God. And nor is God some kind of a tyrannical potentate, a, a selfish person reveling in the shallow flattery of fawning admirers when it reads to give glory to him. That means to cooperate with his Holy Spirit. Cooperate with his Holy Spirit in demonstrating God's love to the world. To pass on the welcoming message, be ye reconciled to God. God's greatest joy is seeing alienated, miserable, wrecked, wrecked people find the sunshine of the healing reconciliation from him. This is his glory. The glory of God is saving lost people. Amen. And we can give him glory by ministering with him in this work of reconciliation. God doesn't want anyone to serve him from fear and terror of being condemned in the judgment, the, ho the hour of his judgment. It cannot be the hour when he condemns the world. We read in John 3.17 these words from Jesus himself. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. If there's anyone that is condemned at last, it won't be the father who condemns him. And Jesus said in John 5.22, the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And furthermore, Jesus says that neither will he condemn those who reject him. In John 12, 47, if anyone hears my word, says Jesus, and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. And so it's very evident that those who finally reject God's grace are not going to hear some scathing denunciations from the lips of either the Father or the Son of God. It will be amid the silence of God. Amid that silence will be the voice of their own accusing conscience, of their own crushing conscience, it will be defeating. John 12, 48 says, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which, is, which judges him. It's the conscience that has heard the word that I have spoken that will judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. And the one whom Christ will judge, he vindicates. And judgment means these words in Revelation 3, 5. Jesus says, I will confess his name before my Father. Amen. Take your name. And Jesus is confessing your name before the Father to vindicate you, to judge you. And so the angels call us to believe God's everlasting gospel in the context of the hour of God's judgment. It's really a message assuring us of vindication. That's what the judgment is. It tells us that in Christ, God has accepted us. God has forgiven us. God has adopted us into his family. And so these three angels proclaim an arresting message 
that focuses all of the revealed truth that God has uh, been communicating for thousands of years, demanding at last a thoroughgoing response. No one can sit on the fence after hearing and understanding this last day message. Everyone will choose either to believe and respond or to disbelieve and reject. And they will line up on one side or the other for the final battle of Armageddon. And the Bible declares that the evil world is going to organize to make war against God. All of these pent up resentments and enmity of the ungodly against God is going to finally erupt in a battle called the Ar Armageddon. And in holy vision, the prophet saw this final conflict developing. He saw, that, saw them as two harvests on earth that will ripen side by side. Those who are the good grain, the loyal to God, and those who are the rebels against God. The clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and the blood came out of the winepress. This is the final crisis. And all upon earth are going to join one side or the other. Those who rebel against him will make war with the Lamb, Jesus. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called chosen and faithful. That's the other side. The spirits... We read in Revelation 16, 14, the spirits of devils that are working miracles go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And so this sheds light upon many mysterious happenings and developments that we see going on in the world today. This war is not to be understood, Armageddon is not to be understood as a literal war of bombs and guns and armaments. You see, the Bible says that the carnal mind is enmity against God. And whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Armageddon is a spiritual war. A spiritual war. But it is even more real than any physical war because these are the final spiritual issues that are lurking in the shadows behind all of the human events of humanity's wars. This great controversy between God and Satan is going to be resolved. For all eternity, truth is going to win the victory. In sim symbolic language, John beheld this final conflict in these words, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, his own blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, clean and white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, that's the word, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh this name written, King of Kings. Lord of Lords. The picture now becomes clear. The enemies of God are the ones who start this last conflict. They're the ones who start Armageddon. It's the kings of the earth and the whole world who are going to join the cause against the Lamb. Some serious world crisis will provoke this eruption of enmity against God as they imagine that somehow God is responsible for the evil that has become by then unmanageable throughout the world. And as the word of God, Christ wins the victory. There are those loyal to him on his side who are clothed in fine linen, clean and white, because they're loyal to him. And the world's enmity will be directed against them also. 
Jesus said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Christ comes to defend, to save them. The reason for God's fierce wrath is not a selfish one. The world will seek to destroy those people who choose to remain loyal to him. As a parent is angry when, he, when some beast tries to beat up or kill his helpless child, so this is what arouses God's anger to defend them. And the ones who stir up the war, the nations to make war against him, those are the spirits of devils working miracles. But those who make war against him think that they have good reason to do so. Revelation gives us no sorrowful, pitiful picture of the Lamb of God turning away from the final scenes of history, staggering away in defeat. Multitudes will joyfully respond to the call of reverence, to reverence the Creator and the Redeemer. It's as though God can hardly contain His joy as He points to these people who are the fruit of his last appeal. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they which keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. With pride, the Father points to them. Jesus points to them. Those who respond are described in Revelation as a special group. I looked, and behold, a lamb that's the crucified Jesus, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his Father's name written on their foreheads. They are agape through and through. That's the name of our God and of the Lamb. These are the ones who follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goes. And in their mouth is found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Can any of us reasonably hope for God to say that he or she is without fault? Can any of us reasonably hope for such a thing? The Bible says yes. Amen. Yes. The grace of the Lamb is going to bring this seemingly impossible goal to pass. A people who are golden through and through. That is what Jesus died to accomplish. Folks, Jesus did not die in vain. Amen. That is the essence of the three angels' message. The message is not sent to prepare a people to die, but to prepare a people for translation at his coming. Satan, I know, wants to insist that it's impossible to overcome as Christ overcame. And there are many theologians and many preachers today who unwittingly side on the enemy's side with this thing. The message of the three angels is that God will certainly have a people who will bring glory to him. Amen. Revelation's primary concern is the vindication of the Lamb who paid an infinite price for our redemption. But his vindication also involves our own vindication because we are all bound up with him as one. And those who stand faithfully with him in this final struggle will not do so in order to gain a reward for themselves. Salvation indeed is a bargain, but getting a good bargain will not be the motive for anyone who truly follows Christ in these last days. Is it possible for a self-centered, egotistical, self-seeking humans who all of our lives have been immersed in pursuing trivial self-interests to, to find a larger perspective than ourselves, which is a genuine heart sympathy with the Lamb of God. Amen. Appreciation of Him for His own sake. Can it transcend both our fear of being lost and a merely selfish hope 
of reward in heaven. That is the mature faith toward which God is calling you and me. For most of our history, we have been prone to see in the three angels' message a fear-oriented, imperious demand either shape up or face damnation. And true, there is in God's last message an element of solemn warning, but John the Revelator recognized that the earth is to be lightened with God's glory, Amen. his character of agape love. And so the apparent terrors of the third angel's message are going to be transcended by God's genial proclamation of his much more abounding grace. Amen. The warning against the mark of the beast is in reality the good news that God is trying his best to persuade us to receive the seal of God. Herein is the most overriding concern of God's most precious message. Let's stop resisting that ongoing grace of God. Let's let Christ do what he wants so much to do, and that is to save you and me from the uttermost. Amen. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, we think of Jesus today and the agonies of his death upon the cross, his God-forsaken bearing of the curse of God for us, which we deserve. And then his communication of love ever since from the sanctuary to woo hearts in reconciliation to God and how he has had to bear sin, yes, even after the cross to this very day and how painful that is for him. We know how painful it is for us to bear our own sin, just our own individual wrongs. But he bears the sin of the whole world to this day. And as we think of our Savior today, we enter into sympathy with Him and identify with Him. Is it possible for us to transcend our own self-interest and our own egotistical issues and have Jesus, the concern for His victory, the total motivation for our faith? Is it possible? Yes, we can overcome, even as Christ overcame. To the uttermost, amen.